Hello everyone, this is your med guru, Dr. Toom, welcoming you again to another session of our med guru CDB YouTube channel for doctors, medical students, and doctors to be. The Lord is on my side and I shall not fear. God bless everyone in your studies and most especially for your upcoming examinations. Now, for this session, we're going to take up some very important must-knows in a very simple, comprehensive, and high-yield approach. This is correlative anatomy of the spinal cord. Now, the spinal cord is considered to be the most caudal part of the central nervous system. It is going to extend from the base of the skull up to the first lumbar vertebrae. Now, most references say the spinal cord ends at L1. However, there are some references that state it ends at L2. So basically, there's a reference of L1 to L2. But if this comes out in the exam, I will still answer the L1 on the basis that the spinal cord extends from the base of the skull all the way up to the level of the first lumbar vertebrae. Now, where does the spinal cord end? Range of L1 to L2 in adults and L3 in newborns. Doc, what if there's a choice L1 and L2 in the exam? Then I would answer L1. Now here is a gross picture of the spinal cord, tip of the red arrow, and where the green pointer is. So as you can see, this is the medulla oblongata, caudal portion of the brain, and the spinal cord is the caudal extension of the central nervous system. Now the spinal cord has three meninges. These are the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. So we have the dura, the arachnoid, then we have the pia mater. Now, the spinal cord also has two enlargements. These are the cervical and the lumbar enlargement. The cervical enlargement is where the brachial plexus originates. So that's basically at the level of cervical 5 to cervical 6. So that's C5, C6, that would be the upper brachial plexus. The lumbar enlargement is the origin of the lumbar plexus. So don't forget the two enlargements of the spinal cord, the cervical enlargement and the lumbar enlargement. Now here is a gross picture showing you the cervical enlargement here. So that's roughly C5, C6. That's where their brachial plexus will originate. Then the lumbar sacral, lumbosacral enlargement down here where the lumbar plexus would also originate. Now, some terminologies you must bring with you to the examination. Number one is the conus medullaris. So this is the terminal portion of the spinal cord. So at the end of the spinal cord, it ends into this cone-like structure, which we call the conus medullaris. Now here, rough estimate, tip of the red arrow, that's your cone-like structure, that's the conus medullaris. Now here's a cross section of the spinal cord, and I want everyone to remember the basic principle, that your gray matter is right in the middle, it's inside, and it forms this famous letter H. Then the spinal canal is there in the middle, the central canal, which is lined by a special epithelium, which we call ependyma. So any tumor arising from the ependyma would be an ependymoma. So don't forget in the spinal cord, the gray matter is inside while the white matter is outside. This is opposite or contrary to that of the brain where the gray matter is on the outside and the white matter is innermost. Now here, 
please take time to review this video, most especially this part. You can repeat it as many times as you want. There are some tracks which we have to remember. Number one, the cortical spinal tract, okay? The lateral cortical spinal tract and the ventral cortical spinal tract. So this is the lateral, this is the ventral. Both are responsible for motor function. So don't forget, descending tracks have motor function. On the other hand, ascending tracks have sensory function. And under the ascending tracks, the ones I want you to memorize is the dorsal columns here and the lateral and the ventral spinothalamic tract. Now, don't forget the lateral spinothalamic tract is responsible for pain and temperature, while the ventral spinothalamic tract is for light and touch, light touch rather. Now, don't forget the dorsal columns is for proprioception and vibration. Now for the blood supply of the spinal cord, this is a must know for any anatomy or neuroanatomy exam. Three major blood supply, arterial supply of the spinal cord will be the anterior spinal artery, posterior spinal artery, then we have a reinforcement of both the anterior and posterior, that is the radicular artery. Then we have the venous drainage, wherein the spinal cord drains into the internal vertebral venous plexus. So please don't forget the blood supply of the spinal cord, anterior and posterior spinal artery with the radicular artery, which reinforces the anterior and the posterior. Now, important structure to know is the phylum terminale. This is defined as the fibrous extension of the pia mater. The function of the phylum terminale is to anchor the spinal cord to the coccyx. So the fibrous extension of the pia mater is the phylum terminale. This will anchor the spinal cord to the coccyx. Then we have the cauda equina. Cauda equina, equina meaning horse or the horse tail. This is the collection of nerve rootlets. So here, look at that closely. That's the conus medullaris. At the inferior end, you have the famous cauda equina, which looks like the horse tail. Now, going back to the blood supply, always remember this for your exams. The anterior spinal artery arises from the vertebral artery. Again, the anterior spinal artery arises from the vertebral artery. This supplies the anterior two-thirds, okay? This supplies the anterior two-thirds of the spinal cord. So as you can see, the area which is shaded here, this is the entire anterior spinal artery territory. So what is left, which is the posterior one-third, this would be the posterior spinal artery. So here is your dorsal columns. So your posterior spinal artery supplies the posterior one-third. Now, the largest radicular artery is the famous artery of Adam Kiewix. The artery of Adam Kiewix is also known as the greater or the great anterior segmental artery. Now, why is the artery of Adam Kiewix something you have to bring with you to the boards? Because the, ad, the artery of Adam Kiewix, as you can see here, reinforces both the anterior and the posterior spinal cord. So God is very wise that for organs that are very sensitive to disruptions of blood flow, he puts collateral circulations there. So if the brain has the circle of Willis, the spinal cord has the artery of Adam Kiewix. Now the artery of Adam Kiewix, I want you to remember, it's right there, is very close to the aorta. So clinical pearl is this. When you have an abdominal aneurysm, which is usually located below the renal artery, 
During repair of an abdominal aneurysm, there are some instances where the artery of Adam Kiewix can be damaged. And since this is a reinforcement of both the anterior and the posterior spinal cord, so take note, anterior supplies to two thirds of the spinal cord, anterior two thirds, while the posterior spinal artery supplies the posterior one third. So going back, let me make a correction. Anterior spinal artery supplies anterior, okay, again, the anterior two thirds, while the posterior spinal artery supplies the posterior one third. So if you injure the reinforcement, therefore, both areas supplied by the anterior and posterior spinal cord would be affected. Your patient post-op would present with paraplegia or paralysis of both legs. Now for the venous drainage, this is very important. As you can see, okay, this extensive plexus, venous plexus, I want to highlight the bassy vertebral veins. This is your vertebral body and this is your intervertebral disc. So please pay attention to this network of venous plexus, which basically is in close vicinity to your vertebrae. This is the venous plexus you should bring with you to the exams. This is the famous vertebral venous plexus or the Batson's plexus. Now, why is the Batson's plexus important? Because the Batson's plexus is comprised of three veins. Internal vertebral venous plexus, the external vertebral venous plexus, and the bassy vertebral veins. So let's repeat that. What are the three veins that contribute to the Batson's venous plexus? Internal and external vertebral venous plexus and the bassy vertebral veins. Now, these three veins, particularly the entire structure, which is the Batson's venous plexus, is responsible for the hematogenous metastasis of cancers to the brain. And these three cancers would be breast, lung, and prostate. So this would explain why breast, lung, and prostate cancer would metastasize to the brain as well as your vertebral column. Now, there are three meninges of the spinal cord. We have the dura mater, the pia mater, and the arachnoid mater. So let's take up the dura mater first. This is the external meninge of the spinal cord. It's an external membrane, which is comprised of dense fibrous tissue. The dura mater will enclose the following, the spinal cord and the cauda equina. I hope you still remember the horse tail. The arachnoid matter is an impermeable, delicate membrane which lies within the dura and it is outside of the pia. Now the arachnoid matter is separated from the pia matter by a space which we call the subarachnoid space. And this subarachnoid space is filled with cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. So this is where we would insert the needle to do a lumbar tap. Now the third meninge of the spinal cord is the pia mater. Memorize by heart that the pia mater is a vascular membrane and it closely covers the spinal cord. Now the pia mater becomes thickened on either side between your nerve roots. And this thickening is specifically called your ligamentum denticulatum. So please memorize that. Now, lastly, let us end with the correlative anatomy of the spinal cord syndromes. Now here's an illustration showing you three very commonly asked spinal cord syndromes in the exams. We have central cord syndrome, this one here, anterior cord syndrome, then we have brown sequard syndrome. As you can see in central cord, the center of the spinal cord is affected. In anterior cord syndrome, as you can see with the shaded pink-orange, 
the area of the anterior spinal artery, which is the anterior two thirds is affected. And in brown sequard syndrome, as you can see, it's a hemi section of the cord or half of the cord is affected. Now let's start with the famous one, the brown sequard syndrome. This is also known as hemi section of the cord. Several references would also refer to brown sequard syndrome as brown sequard's hemisection or brown sequard's paralysis. Now, physical examination findings you must bring with you to the exams. In brown sequard syndrome, there is ipsilateral loss of touch and vibration and contralateral loss of pain and temperature. So here is an enlarged image of your brown sequard syndrome. As you can see, it's a hemi section of the cord. And the two important tracks involved, corticospinal tract, then the spinothalamic tract. I hope you still remember corticospinal tract for motor and spinothalamic tract for your pain and temperature. Now next is the anterior cord syndrome. This results from complete, complete paralysis from the level of trauma. On physical exam, the patient will present with hyperesthesia at the level of the lesion and loss of pain and temperature sensation. Now, this is the pearl I want you to memorize. In anterior cord syndrome, which is of course supplied by the anterior spinal artery, which is the anterior two thirds, it means the posterior one-third is spared, and that will explain why proprioception as well as vibration would be preserved, because it's only the anterior two-thirds which is affected. Now, here's an illustration showing you anterior cord syndrome. So again, the affected area is the area supplied by the anterior spinal artery, anterior two-thirds. And winding down, we have the central cord syndrome. So in central cord syndrome, it's the center of the cord which is affected. And there is sensory sparing. And on history, your clinical history would reveal that the patient presents with greater weakness of the arms rather than the legs. Now here's your central cord syndrome. And we have posterior cord syndrome. So if you remember the posterior cord or the posterior columns, the dorsal columns of the spinal cord, this is where you encounter the position and vibration sensation. So what is involved now is proprioception and vibration. And what is now spared or retained is the anterior two thirds where pain and temperature is found. So as you can see, the yellow area here, this is the posterior columns. So in posterior cord syndrome, common causes would include trauma. We put that number one on the list or compression from tumors and even multiple sclerosis. So here's the posterior cord. The one with the pink stripes. And this is the clinical pearl you have to bring with you as a physician. Tabis dorsalis. This is actually tertiary syphilis, a unique stage of syphilis that has predilection to the posterior columns of the spinal cord. So the pathogenesis here is slow degeneration of the dorsal or posterior columns of the spinal cord. Physical exam, you would have loss of vibration as well as position sense. Now your pearl is the famous Argyll Robertson pupil. The Argyll Robertson pupil is pathognomonic for tertiary syphilis or your tabis dorsalis or what we call neurosyphilis. This is the famous prostitute's eye, your Argyll Robertson pupil. Now why do we call it the prostitute's eye? Because it accommodates, but it does not react. So with this, we end 
our short video session, our tutorial, and board secrets pearls for the spinal cord. God bless everyone and happy studying. This is Doc Toom, your med guru, saying salamat and thank you.